what I've sort of grown into in the role in the last couple of years is not just being a home builder, but being a developer. And what does that mean from a larger scale of infrastructure and not just us providing the homes, but who are we partnering with to do more? You're listening to Stories from the Top, an inside guide to better business development. We are here with Chris Wiseman, the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity of Chester County. So Chris, for those who don't know what Habitat is, can you just give us a brief introduction to Habitat and the Chester County region office? Sure. Habitat for Humanity is a part of a larger organization, international organization that started in a little town called America's Georgia back in the uh, kind of pre-civil rights days. They were a group of individuals who were making sure that everyone had a place to live, they could work on the farm. So the idea was we'll get volunteers together, we'll help build each other's homes, we'll provide the mortgage, and we'll use those payments to help build the next home and the next home and the next home. And that model's been our model since that time. And Habitat Chester County is one of the many affiliates. There's about 250 or so in the country, uh, more than that, obviously across the world. We started back in the late 90s um, and have now developed into the organization we are now, really doing a lot of work um, in the, in the southern and the western part of the county, but expanding as we go along. Very cool. So what did you originally go to school for? <laughs> uh, my, I have a really complicated background. I thought I was going to be an engineer. Then I thought I was going to be um, a teacher, uh, an English teacher, and went around and round. Um, and then I thought for sure I was going to be uh, moving into higher education, ended up working for the YMCA as going through college and just loved the nonprofit work. So I actually worked about Twenty, almost 25 years with the Y, with a, a, an English degree, a, a minor in physics and computer science, and a meteorological degree because I was in the Air Force for a while too. So I don't know how any of that applies to what I'm doing right now, but it definitely gave me uh, different experiences. And then being with a nonprofit for that long, um, and then really discovering that that's kind of my passion to serve in the community, that was probably the best of the education more than even being at school. So what is it about nonprofits that you like better than for-profits? Well, having, you know, kind of worked on both sides with, with the Y, because I think the YMCA sort of is both at the same time. We do a lot of the work in the community, but we're also membership based and we have to, you know, perform for our customers and it's sort of a workout place. Um, but knowing that at the end of the day, what you do is going to have a direct impact and you can draw that straight line to what's happening. Um, what I loved about the Y was there was a lot of it we're doing. What I love about Habitat is it's really clear. Our mission is what it is. We are providing, we're providing opportunities for affordable home ownership where they just wouldn't exist. And we're creating generational change, wealth that would never be able to be generated until you buy your first home. And we're you know knocking down those barriers and making that happen. <clears throat> so when you started at the Y, what was your role and what were you doing when your first entrance into nonprofits? I started off just as a lifeguard and then swim instructor. And then I did uh, day camp and kind of a little bit of everything. It was kind of that journey through there that took me away from engineering, working with kids, thinking that I would want to be a, a teacher. And so I loved that part of it. I just loved it. And then as I took on more uh, responsibility and became a director and oversaw multiple programs and then started moving around the different Ys all throughout the country, I'm from Charlotte and I grew up there. Um, but around 2000, I took a new position out in LA, completely uplifted and changed my life, uprooted and changed my life. So I went to LA for a while, then San Diego, Chicago for a little bit, back to North Carolina um, for, to work for the Y, and then ultimately came back, uh, came, moved up here to Philadelphia area to work for the YMCA until I moved over to Habitat. So I, I've done a little bit of everything from membership to sports to aquatics to, you know, administration, business, finance. It's one of those things, if you work for the Y long enough, you could probably run your own business because you've done literally everything. So what do you think were some of the like more important skills you learned in all those positions at the Y that helped carry into Habitat, like some of the admin skills and business development type stuff? I think everything ultimately comes down to relationships. And we really focused on building that, whether you're the lifeguard building a relationship, you know, with that kid that you're trying to teach, whether you're you know, doing development and trying to raise money and building, develop, you know, do, building relationships with outside vendors. And, and that always translates. I, when I was with the Y, I was a trainer. We did a lot of internal training throughout the country. So we would train folks to go out and teach people how to do these skills that we would do, leading successful teams, volunteerism, you know, financial management. And 
as you start to do those, you, you know, as you teach, you become a better teacher, right? So, and you become better at those opportunities. And so I think throughout those different skills that we learned through that we were teaching others, I was developing and learning from them as well. So I just, it felt like all of that culminated in, in being able to come and work at Habitat. And I took a break actually from, from working at a nonprofit. I, I love the why, but there was a point where it was just a lot, right? Working probably 50, 60 hours a week and, and having a family and trying to just manage all of that. And I took a break and I went to work at a private school for a little while uh, as a director of operations. And that was great, but it didn't take long for me to realize that that's not where I wanted to be. I did miss the nonprofit. I missed being in the community. I missed, you know, working with those people that needed us a little bit different in a, at a high end private school, um, especially in the director of operations role where you're basically in charge of all the non fun parts of the school, all parking and dining services and security and all that stuff. So when the opportunity to come back into nonprofit and especially come back into Chester County and to come back into an area that I can I knew I could serve. And taking the shoes of someone that I knew really well who was retiring from the position, it was kind of just lined up perfectly. So uh, when you're working in a nonprofit, do you find that the the pressures and the stress of that job are different um, because you are really impacting people's lives? Like, do you feel a different gravity of that job position? Um, just, be, you know, I've done it for so long, I don't know anything else. I do feel take that very seriously when we when we talk to, especially in this role with homeowners um, and someone's going through the application process, it's very vulnerable. I mean, they have to share everything for us. We're a mortgage holder, so we have to have all their background, all their credit. We have volunteers who go and visit their home to see the shape that it's in, to make sure that they are in need. Um, and that's very, you know, that's, that's a lot to ask of the person who's coming in to be one of our homeowners. And so we try to be as respectful as we can. We try to understand where they're coming from, where they're starting. And then the journey, once they become a Habitat applicant, is not done. They have to go through credit counseling. They have to do what we call sweat equity, which is 200 hours of actually working on uh, the homes. And so through that process, we get to know them extremely well. They become really important parts of our family. And they learn how to be great homeowners. Not only are they invested now in the home that they're building, but for any of us that have just moved into a new home or have our own first home, there's so many things we don't know until we do it, right? So we're teaching them basic plumbing skills, how to fix drywall, how to do some electrical work, which makes for a more successful homeowner, a better community, better neighbor, you know. So so we take all of that very seriously from that first, you know, application part when that comes in to being then their mortgage holder for the next 30 years. That relationship's not going to end for a really long time. So it, it's a, it's we hold that really as an important part of what we do. So as you were going through your time at the Y, was there any mentors or people who kind of helped you navigate the whole nonprofit profit sector? You know, I've, I was just having this conversation um, with some folks a couple of days ago. What was unique about the Y is that there is a lot of leadership that isn't your traditional leadership. Um, we, I, most of my bosses were female. Um, several of them were LGBTQ, which was great. And so I never, as you sort of get into that world and talk about it, it never seemed different than what my experience was almost I, I look back at my greatest mentors were were all women uh and very strong leaders ymca brandywine valley last place i worked um the ceo and the coo are both women three of the five big execs are are women so it was nice to be sort of i guess in a different kind of leadership and and i think having that diversity of leadership together just makes for a more well-rounded group of, of employees as well because you attract different groups and so I've tried to make sure that I bring that along with me and try to make sure, I mean, I, I flat have stolen a few of my old employees to bring them over to work at Habitat um, and to fill out those roles and sort of understand my place within that, within that diversity too, and use that, you know, appropriately. That comes into play with the homeowners that we serve, with the community members that we interact with too. So I feel like all of that is sort of mingled into creating this way of being that that's just works for our organization and for the staff and others too. What was some of the guidance and strategies those mentors gave you in your time there? I think what's been the most helpful has been their clarity in seeing what I was good at and what I wasn't and not focusing on what I wasn't and really promoting what I was good at. Um, I remember one leader talking about like, we could spend a ton of time, Chris, talking about the things that you're kind of bad at and maybe get you to good. I mean, we can, you know, put the, but there are things you're good at. If we spend even less time, we can make you great. 
And so why not really focus in, you know, doing that piece and, and let the other stuff go? Like, let's fill in the gaps. You know, there's, we all have our baggage stuff. We have to make sure that we, you know, make sure that we do well enough to be able to do the good stuff. But I really thought that was like, what a great approach to look at people and, and think about how you lift them up to do the best possible thing they can do. And sometimes that's helping them be in a different role because maybe the role they're in isn't going to ever let them get to the great. Sometimes that's helping them move on to a different location. I have a lot of uh, mentees and friends that I once worked at the Y that I've helped them move on, as we would say, be successful somewhere else. And so, you know, really not focusing on what you can't do, but what you can really do great. And what were some of those qualities that they recognized that you were good at that they wanted to continue to develop? So uh, I feel like the, there was, I wouldn't call it a fast track, but there was this momentum that was, at a point where, man, there's this going out and telling the story of what we're doing, being in that role of thinking of big picture, of setting, you know, kind of a vision. Those were things that just sort of came natural. Uh, I didn't know how to hone those skills, but I just could see and step back. We have this thing at the Y, we would do this training called the fishbowl. And it's kind of that idea of being inside and outside the fishbowl at the same time. Can you be inside, swimming around, participating, being a part of it? but smart enough to take a step out and see what else is needed in the group, in the community, in the, you know, in the organization that you're serving, and then being able to fill those gaps, whether yourself or with someone else. So I, I, I often joke, I really only have a couple of really strong skill sets. I'm, I'm really good at surrounding myself with people who are wonderful, both personally and professionally. Um, no one can build a better staff team that I can do that. I just, it's just something that's, I've been able to do. And it's not just instinct. It's that's was, Oh, Chris really does have staff that respond. I think because of how I responded to my leaders and I mirrored that, but that's worked. So he's going to build a really great staff team around him. That's a number one. I, I found out for in a couple of weird situations that I'm great in a crisis. If something really bad happens, you probably want me there to kind of help think it through and get through straight. Um, you know, and, and that sort of makes it all work, you know, and so I've really made that the focus of even when I came into this role, let's really develop the, the staff team that we need. Let's make sure we have the systems in place so that we can all be successful. And yeah, it feels like it's it's we're starting to see uh, the momentum of that success happen right now. Yeah. So when <clears throat> when did you start at Habitat? Um, so I started right during the shutdown of COVID. <laughs> My first interviews were in person. My last interviews were virtual. So I started in April of 2020. Okay. And what, what exactly is the definition of the direct role that you have? Like, what are the responsibilities of that job? So our affiliate is, um, we have a board of directors and they have fiduciary responsibilities, meaning that they, you know, approve the budget. They set the, you know, the goals for the organization. And ultimately they hire and fire the executive director to run the day-to-day -day operations. So my role as executive director is that I run all aspects of the of the organization from development to construction to our restores uh, and report all that back through to the board and you know and, and work through the committees to make sure that all of that's working at the highest levels so what was the state of chester county's habitat when you came in was it like a bad exit were they we need help we need to get this old guy out and you in or was it like, what was the status of things? No, my predecessor had retired. Uh, and so they'd gone through a little bit of a, of a space without a, a leader, uh, like directly. They had some interim folks that were helping out. And the board itself had stepped in and was really doing a lot of the direct heavy lifting, um, which is not typically the board's job. I mean, you, the board is, was wonderful. And we, we've been blessed to kind of have just the right people at the right time in our leadership roles. Um, if we hadn't had those, I don't know what would have happened. Um, we were slow. We were building two or three homes a year. Um, we really, our fundraising was just okay. We had uh, the restore in Callan Township, which was which was really successful. Uh, but a few years before, we had another one in Kennett that didn't make it. So we were at a place where there was, and the need in Chester County is great for affordable housing. And so when I looked into the position, um, you know, my, my first kind of question was, well, what do we need to actually make an impact? I don't think two or three homes a year is going to make the impact. What what's a number that starts to make sense? And my predecessor had actually done a really good job of setting up some some dominoes that that I helped push over uh, to get some additional land and start and start moving. So we we went from two to three to four to five to this next year and the next couple of years we're going to be doing a minimum of fifteen houses a year. We've just bought some more properties. We're not just doing new homes. We're now doing rehabilitations where we buy the property and we're like a really bad flipper where we <laughs> buy it and then turn it over and sell it for less than we would have made money on it. But it's another affordable, you know, home in Chester County. 
And we've just started a new program called Critical Home Repair, which um, it's kind of the, this is sort of the larger impact of keeping affordable housing in Chester County. We have homes that um, for whatever reason, maybe someone's aging in place, maybe they uh, have some special needs and the house can't, doesn't, this is accommodating for what they need, but it's an affordable house once they sell it. So we want to make sure that affordable house stays in that stock and usable. So we come in and we do those critical repairs. We just finished one now where there was new windows, a new bathroom for an older gentleman, um, those kind of things to make sure that he can then stay in that place longer, safer. And then when it's time to go to sell, that's a house that will be another affordable house that stays in the market that doesn't become one of those homes that has to be torn down or rehabbed completely. It's it's one that will you know, continue its life as, as we intended to for an affordable house. So th there's a lot going on. Um, it, it's the, the ch now the challenge is making sure that we have the operational capacity to do all of that. We've been, we've been hiring new staff. We've been looking at new systems. When we were managing just a couple of sites, very different than now managing seven, eight, nine, ten 10 sites. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's the next level that we're getting to now. Can you explain for us the business model of Habitat for Humanity? Like, where does your cash come from? How, do, how does it all work? Yeah, so it does go back to that sort of first ideology of we'll build a house, we'll put a mortgage on it, and we'll use those funds to make sure that we can help build the next house. We get our funding from a couple different sources. Mainly, we get our, our financial, we get the revenue side from donations. Um, and those donations can be individuals, they can be corporations, they can be foundations. One way that we let people know about what we do and they can experience it directly is a thing called team builds. And so corporations and different groups come in, they, they, it's a small sponsorship, but they get to have a day of building on site with the volunteers, with the homeowners, and they get to see and feel what that looks like. Um, and that has a lot of, I mean, it's, it's $2,500, so it's not that much for a corporation to come in, but the impact it has, they often come back. We find a lot more support from them for donations of product and different things later on, sponsorships at other events. And even some of our board members start as uh, realizing, oh, this is what Habitat does. So we have those pieces that come in. We call it the Fund for Humanity. Those are the mortgages that we hold right now. That generates about 275000 a year. It's kind of like our endowment. Um, we don't have a direct endowment, but our endowment are in the homes. We don't want the cash sitting in the bank. We want it in the homes. So as those mortgages get paid back, we add that to the bottom line as well. And then the other significant piece is the restore. And I talked about the one we have in Callan. This is for, for those that don't know what a restore is, and I didn't know what it was when I first got here. Um, the best way to describe it is kind of like a home goods in, in and in slightly used and sometimes new items that we get. Um, it has its own mission separate from that. I mean, it funds basically the build of a house each year, each one of them do. Um, but also more importantly, I think that then than just doing that piece of it, there's a sustainability piece. There's uh, thousands of tonnage of, of different things that would be going to a landfill that we're finding a new home for. So, and that's become a really important part of how we talk about the restore. So not only are we generating revenue back to the organization, which is important to build that, it's now in a, a place where folks can buy stuff that's affordable, you know, so it's all the home goods, furniture and appliances, different things, uh, construction items. But so that part is there, but all the stuff that's no longer going and being left and destroyed in a landfill that we're able to sort of take out of that, that, that pattern. So, so all of those come together. And then we also underwrite the cost of our expenses in a number of ways, some really important ways. So we talked about working with the, the homeowners, we also work with other volunteers. Some are skilled, some are not. Um, but we, we only have three paid staff that work in, in the, on the construction side. Everyone else is a volunteer, which is kind of an amazing piece. So that helps lower the cost of it. And then finally, we work with outside groups to provide some of the product. So we have some internet, we have national uh, brands that help with us, like Sherwin Williams provides paint at a discount, Maytag, those kind of things. Local companies like Vywinco, who can provide windows, St. Gobain, who provide product for us. So those organizations come in as well. We actually, with the price of lumber being as crazy as it is, we actually have another organization that we're working with this weekend. That's a, that's a church and it's called Help Build Hope. And they actually are building the walls um, for our five units that were one of the five unit sets that we're building down in West Grove. So you add all that in and underwrite the cost of the expenses. You look at what that is. And then when it comes down to it, this is where it gets a little bit into the weeds, but it's a little bit complicated. We, our mortgage for the homeowners is not the full amount of the house. We have a, a forgivable mortgage over time and it's forgivable so that the homeowner doesn't 
they can't come right back in and sell the house as soon as they get it, but they're paying at a rate that they can afford. And the, and the most important part is it's 0%. It's a 0% 30-year mortgage once they qualify as a Habitat homeowner. So that affordability makes it work for them. And plug it all together, it's, it's a model that works. So I had another question about um, your staffing for the building projects. You said you have three paid employees on each construction site. No, three total for all of the construction that we do. Really? Yeah. So how do you manage building a house, something that's complex, takes a lot of expertise? How do you manage that with only three people and, and you have 15 you know, job sites and three paid staff and then the rest are volunteers? Like, What systems do you have in place to make that work? And that's we're growing to that now. So we, we were, we have one big site that we're actually finishing up in the Coatesville area. It's called Cambria Terrace. Um, we're actually building the last four homes of that 40 plus community. And then the other big one we're working on is called Fuller Meadows named after the, the founders of Habitat, um, the Fullers. And that's in West Grove. And that's uh, another 40 homes in groups of five townhomes. And we're, each one is a phase and we're in the phase three and four we're building right now. We're mostly we're managing those two sites. And that was sort of I wouldn't say easy, but it was easier to be able to manage kind of two locations with two staff. As we've grown and expanded with these other opportunities, we've hired another person within the office to sort of be the overall director of construction operations, started to put systems into place where we can actually manage uh, the sites as a construction, you know, uh, company. I mean, you have to sort of thank you, thank you yourself in that way. We have you know, we have the development side, which is its own sort of nonprofit. We have the retail side, which is completely different. And then the construction side, which is completely different. And so going back to my skills of hiring well, we, I think the people that we've hired has really been able to give us the systems to put in place, you know, looking at just different project management skills and then QuickBooks and different things that all integrate to give us the background of that. But then ultimately it comes down to the volunteers. We have amazing volunteers and skilled volunteers There'll be some who have been there for every one of those home builds, all 40 plus in the Cambria area. And and they're invaluable. And and we use them, you know, exclusively sometimes as almost a, a project manager. I mean, they're on our insurance, they can drive our truck, they they know the skills. And what's great about some of these houses is once you've built one, you, you kind of know how to build the next one. The plans are there, but once you kind of get the feel for what they look like and feel like these guys just, they do an amazing job. So yeah, it, without the volunteers, we, we wouldn't be able to do it. What's your guys' strategy to keep those like high value volunteers, I'll call them. What's your strategy to, you know, keep them retained and focused on your projects? I'm sure they're valuable anyway. They could probably make a lot of money with their skills. What do you guys do to just keep them around? You know, we inherited a lot that are just in it because they love it. I mean, they, they have an attachment and, and I think unlike, just going and volunteering at a space, they're there for weeks, months, you know, years, getting to know those Habitat homeowners. And so they build these real relationships with them. They're, they're the front facing group of what we, of who we, you know, how we serve them. And, you know, we throw lots of love at them. We have lunches, you know, we, we have events, you know, annual to take care of them, but honestly, it's just their passion and they recruit one another. A lot of them are retired or semi-retired and they've been in the construction trades and just want to continue to give back. Um, some come out, you know, as often you know, when they can. And then we throw in those team builds that come in. We've actually had about 50 team builds this last year. People are hungry to get back out and do things, I think, after COVID. And so we use those skill sets, too. Those are less skilled laborers. Um, sometimes we have to point which way the hammer goes just to make sure they're doing everything safely. Yeah, I was gonna, how do you manage those people who could almost be more of a hindrance than a help at point? Like, who's responsible in the job for making sure everyone's... Yeah, so those three paid staff lead the with, with the help of the volunteers, but they're the ones who are definitely responsible for the team builds. We have uh, one, of, one of the members of our development team is responsible also for sort of making sure their experience is really strong. They get t-shirts, they get lunch, you know, and they talk about what the mission is and they go through it. We're, we're strategic about where we put them and actually having more sites is actually going to be more helpful and being able to, you know, if, if we're at the stage where there's just all plumbing, there's not much they can do. But if we're you know, taking, we're putting up drywall, if we're painting, if we're, you know, just laying down concrete, that's all things we can teach a volunteer to do pretty quickly. You know. Do you guys have a system? Like if you spot a new volunteer, like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. He could be great. Is there anything in prog and any process you guys have to kind of get them to come back for other projects? Oh, well, for sure. I, I think of it from my level um, about what they're able to provide from the larger scale for the organization. And so if Pico or, you know, one of those larger companies come out and thinking about what they're able to help us do. Um, I always make sure to make contact with those groups that are there. 
and, and have them. We, we, it's, it's, what's interesting is we definitely have a process for training volunteers. So we have that part of it and there's a safety piece they obviously go through and then there's kind of the daily stuff. But even our skilled volunteers, as we bring in to do different kinds of work, electrical work that may not be their expertise, we set up opportunities for them to be able to learn from them. So our skilled volunteers become even more skilled, right? And they're able to translate that and teach each other and work with like vendors who come from the outside and eventually, and, and there are times our volunteers will tell you they'll do it better than most of the vendors that come in. It's just sometimes it's just a timing piece. So how many volunteers are on, like, on the average day? How many are on a job site? total so when there's not a team build and it's just our average ones we'll probably have between 20 to 30 volunteers wow, so uh, between our sites it's a good yeah. size it's crew for sure we're our our sites are closed on the weekend or, or closed monday and tuesday um, we do some work on saturday and so and then tuesday is as our day for the internal staff to really get everything together to line it up to get those you know kind of opportunities in place for who's coming and then we will switch it around a little bit when we know we have a team build coming when we sort of think about, okay, what do we need to set up to make sure that it works? That was a bit of a challenge during COVID because we just couldn't have as many volunteers and, and, we, and we were working inside houses was different when we were working outside houses. And so we that slowed down for a bit. So I think that now that people have been doing it for years and, and we get groups that you know, State Farm and others who just, that this is their outing, this is their team building. This is what they wanna do every year is come out and build uh, with Habitat. So they become better every year at what they're doing. They understand, you know, from, from kind of day one, how to do the job that we're going to give them to do. And whatever it is, they're hungry to do it. We don't want them to do, just be laborers. We want them to feel the impact of, you know, picking up a hammer and, you know, and knocking that nail in. Um, but sometimes that's what's needed and they're happy to do it. So how many of your volunteers are just individuals versus how many are corporations kind of doing a group volunteer effort? Most of our volunteers are individuals. Um, and so, and we've got probably that go out on a regular basis. Like when we reach out to them for our needs is probably around 200 or so volunteers that we pull from and they different volunteers come different days. They don't only volunteer on the job site. They also volunteer at the restore and helping out as well. And, and that's really helpful too. Cause as we get, we get donations on the backside, there's a lot of product that we have to, you know, figure out to get in. Um, we have, do have paid staff who go and pick up in our, and we have a truck, a box truck that goes across Chester County and picks up donations, but they help them get them off the truck. They help stage things in the front. They help get people to their, to, into their cars when they, when they buy product and stuff like that too. And then, you know, they, they may be, even if we have a resource in them that we can use differently, we may ask them to assist one of our, um, homeowners in, in, on, on one of the things that they may have a need with, whether budgeting or whatever like that as well too. So we try to incorporate as much as we can into their opportunity to do what they love to do, but also expand upon that and do other things as well. So when you have a job site, like I'm sure there's a number where you don't want 50 people working on it's too much. How do you guys coordinate? How many people are going where? Like who's in charge of that scheduling and how do they manage all that? Yeah, we have a volunteer coordinator um, who, who's, who's also our uh, family services director. So she works directly with the families, directly with the volunteers. We have a system online to track all of our volunteer hours. That's an important piece of our audit and keeping up with the expectations, you know, from international, but also, you know, just from local organizations. And, and there's a schedule so they can go in and they log on and they can see, you know, what's going on that day, who's going to be on site, where the need is. Um, the need is only growing, so we need more and more volunteers. It sounds like we have a lot of volunteers, but now that we're going to be in multiple sites and multiple places, um, it's going to be really critical that we have even more and people who can do different things. Uh, critical home repair is very different than building a new house. So uh, we're, we've been talking to and looking at different volunteers, kind of those different skill sets and hoping to get some, some additional folks to come in. So it sounds like you need a, a ton of volunteers. I imagine there's a decent amount of turnover with those volunteers as well. Um, do you guys do any marketing to reach out and, and source new volunteers or how do you go about that? So most of it's still word of mouth. Um, this is one of those, as we're growing, we don't wanna grow too fast. Our volunteer, uh, we have very little attrition. I mean, once people come in and volunteer and, and get that Sort of taste of what it feels like to build and build with the, with the homeowner that's coming in um they they stay they they really love so we, we don't we don't lose too many of those so sometimes they even become our staff i mean we've uh, our last one of our last who just retired 
um, site supervisors had been a chemistry teacher at the high school for years and coming up and doing builds. We, we, have, we also have volunteers that we have clubs in the high schools, uh, Habitat clubs, who are a part of it as well. So bringing groups up and being a part of that. And when he retired, he was like, I don't want to stop doing this. And well, we need a staff person to help run these things. So, you know, the recruitment piece hadn't been as important as, as it is right now with the expanding of different opportunities that are going to be coming in the next year. Um, I mean, we, we have so much that just came onto our plate. There's, there's, uh, will be a couple of announcements coming in the next couple of days that aren't, aren't public yet. That's even going to expand our opportunities for, for doing some of these programs even more. So how do you guys deal with the liability of bringing sometimes unskilled workers into active construction sites? Is that, you guys have insurance covered? How do you guys manage all that? Yeah, we have pretty robust insurance. Luckily, the one thing that's great about working at Habitat is that we're not the first Habitat, right? So even in our area, most of the counties around us, Philadelphia, Montdelco is one, Berks, Bucks, we, we meet together regularly. We, we talk about best practices. Have International has um, it's one of the other vendors that we actually use that helps kind of spread that across the country from so to keep those costs down for insurance. And then we work with companies, too, that help um put together the safety plan to make sure that, you know, we're not going to give them, you know, a saw that day, you know, for, for an unskilled person. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we have people that we actually, some of those skilled volunteers we bring onto our insurance to be able to be drivers, to be able to, you know, handle some of those, some of those tools. They have to have had the background. We have constant kind of training and, and stuff with that. We follow the OSHA rules. So, um, you know, knock on wood, we've really had no real issues with, with that piece of it. We don't put people on roofs. You know, we, we really are careful about where we put, especially, you know, team builds and other folks like that. Everything's kind of ground level or, or a safety piece. And, you know, and our staff are really, really good about pointing out, we wear hard hats and you know, all the things we need to wear, but pointing out where the safety issues could lie. So your organization is working in conjunction with all the other habitats. Do you guys have like your own territories? Is it by county or how does that work? Yeah, in our area, it's mostly by county. Sometimes there's regional um, by city if the city's bigger. Um, but yes, ours is all of Chester County, which is is unique in that we, you know, Chester County is such a such a diverse place. I mean, there are parts that are very rural, parts that are very urban, right? And so we, us, there's 72 different municipalities in Chester County, which and everyone has kind of a different way of doing their zoning and, and their business plan for affordable housing. So that's a unique challenge for us is figuring out, you know, kind of how to get through each one of those different places as we start to build. Um, I think that's true of a lot of the other surrounding counties too. So we, so we use some of those resources together. We are the executive directors and, and the folks at different levels too meet on a pretty regular basis to talk about what's coming. We get together every couple of years for a larger affiliate conference. Um, we were finally able to have our first one in several years down in Atlanta. And then and then we have a, a really robust online group um, through our Yammer and different things that we're able to really, anytime there's a new idea, it's not a new idea. Someone's doing it somewhere and you can reach out to that affiliate and kind of find out, you know, how does it, how are you building 3D walls with concrete? How, you know, how did that get started? So we can use those resources and leverage. It's like any good teacher, right? You steal the best ideas and use them. And you guys excuse me, are not Section 8. So how do you guys go about getting like building permits? What's your process for applications and stuff like that? Yeah, from that piece, we're, we are a construction company. I mean, and, and, and that's the unique piece of it. And so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try to leverage that for, you know, as we, as we move into those different spaces. Um, but yeah, zoning is always going to be the first sort of hurdle to get through. Um, and, and there's this, new philosophy that's coming out that's called the missing middle. So right now, most of what you see in housing is either high density houses, apartments and whatnot, or single family homes. And, you know, in the past, we've seen duplexes, triplexes, the idea of thinking about that sort of in the middle of, could you build something that's on one space, you know, one foundation, but, but four homes in a quad. And there's examples of that in our area for for-profit that's really worked. It looks like a really high end single family home, but there's actually four homes with all separate entrances. They're built a little bit differently. One of them may be a zero entry and, and no steps. And it's great for someone who's, who's a little bit older, who's going to be aging in place, doesn't need as much space. Um, and then and what's great about that from a builder standpoint is, is economy of scale, right? So now you're building four houses basically on one foundation. So we're getting, working through all of that within the county and trying to figure out, okay, where and when can we do those things? For the most part, we're still... Step one, building, getting them to, you know, zone the property accordingly. 
I will say Chester County, from a, a leadership, a government standpoint, really gets it, really understands the need for affordable housing. It, not just for the fact that there are individuals who need it, but for the economic growth of our county, it's absolutely essential. And, and the folks that we're serving, you mentioned Section 8, that, that's that's a whole different group that, that needs that support. We're basically the folks to... to a, apply and become a Habitat homeowner. You just have to be in the 70th percentile of the of the AMI in our county. But because our county is such a, a wealthy county, that could be 60, 70,000 a year that you're making. You know, maybe you have a couple of kids, but at that m- amount, you don't have enough for down payment. Your credit might not be great, so you're not going to get a super, you know, good interest rate until you're just stuck. And so th- if you want to be able to, if you're in Westchester and you, you have these great little boutiques and you want someone to be able to work there, but they can't get there easily. You want someone who lives in the community, you need affordable housing. And that's true of every municipality, you know, across the county. You have to have affordable housing. They're your teachers, they're your nurses, you know, they're 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 the mushroom farmers in the south. Like if they don't have the place to live, they can't work there. Right? So that's where I think we come in with that really important piece of making it affordable for them and working with those municipalities to understand that. And then Chester County has been incredibly supportive from a from a financial standpoint, but also helping to make the right contacts. It, the zoning piece all comes down to the local municipality, um, but knowing kind of the process and, and, and being able to show the results of the houses we put in and what that looks like, it, it's, a, it's a good message. So overall, is the, the county and the townships, are they welcoming of your projects or do you have any opponents like politically who kind of don't want the affordable housing coming in? Sure. Let me call out all the people who don't like this. <laughs> no, I, I've been blessed to be, to inherit a couple of that went through that process at the beginning. And I know that it was it was tumultuous at times, right? To be able to get to that place of building. The the greatest thing we have right now is the success that we've had. So anytime there are you know the NIMBYs, you know, not in my backyard, we can say, well, look at this community that we built in West Grove. And 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 just look how amazing these townhomes look. And even selling to the community, that's actually a really great model because there was originally a developer that was looking at building, you know, almost million dollar homes and they could have built maybe four homes right in that space. Well, that's $4 million worth of tax revenue for, for them. Well, each one of ours sells for 200,000. So, and we're putting eight different you know phases in there. So now it's $8 million worth of, of, of tax incentive. And we were able to actually work closely with the West Grove Borough to do a lot of infrastructure that they needed, not just for our project, but for the whole borough to be able to bring stuff in and relocate, you know, utilities and stuff like that. So it was a win, win, win. You know, every everyone ends up coming better for it. So if we can show that model to other municipalities and say, look, this is this is how it works. Um, go to Coatesville and look at Cambria, where where we built there. It used to be an old. Um, it's called the Oak Street Housing Project. It was scary, and I, I've seen the old pictures. And and the rumor was like police wouldn't even go there during calls because they were so frightened. Now you look at the ones that that we built there, and we've literally changed the landscape of Coatesville. You know, we have a great video with a flyover that shows you know that. And you could see it, even the the show that was on HBO of Mayor of Easttown, the in the background, I was like, oh, that's our houses from Cambria. Like it's 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 that it's HBO worthy, right? So it's so having those models to be able to go and show municipalities, we're, we're in a couple of those with development right now, and it hasn't been very resistant. Although I will say I purposely stayed out of a few places that we don't have direct connections with, so I'm 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 focusing where I know I can have an impact. Maybe eventually there'll be other places where we'll have some of that resistance, but luckily not too bad yet. And how have you seen the that change families when they have access to a home as opposed to, you know, living in an apartment or something like that? What changes does it afford them? Oh, there, there's so many things. And there's a great way of thinking about this called the social determinants of health. And, you know, the, the obvious is just having a st- stable place to live. That, and that's first and foremost. I mean, most folks who live in an apartment they don't live there more than a few years at a time. They're transient, which means that their, their kids are moving from school to school. Uh, you know, they're not able to be, build deep roots into the community. So just having that stable place first is really important. The the being able to come and go into the middle class, the the, the path is through owning a home. I mean, and, and all of us who know that, who, who once we first buy and you build that equity and you realize that you actually have this leverage, this tool to be able to build wealth. And to be able to make decisions about your future and not just be stuck paycheck to paycheck or waiting for the next disaster to happen. So that becomes a critical piece. And we've seen that that example over and over and over again. We have one family who just leveraged, you know, the um, some equity in their home to be able to send their kid to Harvard. It could not have happened. 
right? Would that no chance of sending their kid to an Ivy League or to a school like that. Um, but because they're able to be able to, okay, I, we've been doing great. We've paid in everything and we have this now ability to, to get you started and, and get you there. So that changes. But more than that, what we find is in these, these social determinants of health, if someone is in a stable home, a home that they own and the parents are buying, then a lot of things start to happen. There's less abuse, less chance of someone you know, uh, being hurt, uh, less chance of um, all kinds of communicable diseases that happen. A lot of uh, issues with um, lead and mold, and different things like that that happen too. So uh, you start to see in complete community change for people who are in those homes and it, it it's immeasurable. But for me, my favorite part of all of this, and you can just see it every time, I, I've been, I, I, I make sure I'm the one who actually hands over the keys when we go to closing and there's never a dry eye because everyone realizes this is the moment that their life has just changed. We have our place. Our kids aren't living in, you know, three kids in a room sharing with, you know, it, it, that's the thing too that we see. And I mentioned we have a group of volunteers who go out and make sure that the, the folks are in need and they're in desperate need. And so just that change coming from the instability to a place that's substandard to this place that, they, that is theirs, they can make their own and that they've helped build, it works. So you mentioned one of your strengths is staffing and hiring. So on the admin side of things, what is your strategy for great hiring and bringing in people who compliment you and the rest of the team? I think that's a big piece of it is, is I know what I'm not good at, <laughs> uh, which is a lot of things. So thinking about, yeah, who, who, who can do those pieces of the organization that I'm not good at and that I need guidance for. And then understanding, like I said earlier, is kind of strip away the things that aren't going to be important to making them okay. What are the things we can give them that are going to make them great? And, and, and then knowing how that fits into the larger vision of the organization, knowing that we have to increase development. What does that look like? You know, that construction is going to be greater and we're going through a huge growth stage. What does that look like? And what does that mean? And, you know, I, and I think when the rubber meets the road, what we do from a leadership standpoint, uh, you know, I'm, I have a director of operations and I have a head of development and I have a head of construction and I have someone who runs the restore. They're the experts in what they do, you know, and I have a lot of trust and faith in being able to give them what they need to do their job and then get out of the way and, and really let them do it. Our director of operations has been here for over 25 years. So, um, and, and is a genius at writing like gr government grants. Right. And so, you know, leveraging that from him, I, I mentioned, I stole a couple of staff, uh, from the Y that I brought over on my old membership director, my old executive assistant, who is now our director of development, because I already knew. Right. I mean, what what great relationship builder she was and, and how she could do that. Our fundraising increased 50 percent once she came here. So that was we had a five year plan to sort of looking at, all right, how are we going to fund all of these builds? We thought, all right, well, let's look at building a second restore. Let's look, look increasing, you know, uh, our, our development. Let's do a couple other things. We did all that in a year. You know, and I say we generously that I'm a part of it. I honestly just hired them and, and let and let them do it. But I think that also is this accountability of we're good at our jobs. You know, it, I'll say something that's also unique about this particular staff team is that that we're I won't say we're older, but we're not younger. We it, we're sort of all of us that are very similar stages of our life, which is also sort of an appreciation of we have kids at certain ages. We also have sort of parents that sometimes we have to help take care of. And that kind of common understanding of we're going to do our job, but we're also going to take care of our families and take care of each other gives us that flexibility to be able to to do the job well, but also do it in a way that we know is meaningful. I I worked too much when I was at the Y, you know, and I and I gave too much of myself into into trying to, you know, be successful in that career. Um, and luckily had a had a partner who set me straight and kind of helped guide me back towards this is the part of your life that matters most. And so let's not lose that and always have that picture of it. And I think for a lot of us that became really kind of very clear during during the pandemic, but I'd sort of established that even beforehand of, okay, however I'm going to work, I'm going to work differently. I'm going to put my family right in front of everything. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to make them a part of my work, but I'm also going to make them, you know, separate and let them have me when they need me. And that's going to be our philosophy when we work together. And that's the, and all the staff know that. And so we have days where we work in the office, days we don't work in the office. If there's anything that we need to take care of from outside of it, we'll, we'll do it. And then we'll come back. And I think there's a uh, an expectation of, okay, we need to do our jobs really well so that we can have this flexibility and freedom to work the way we want to, to take care of our families the way we want to. 
And I just feel like people respond to that. Do you have any tips or strategies for nonprofits or even for-profit businesses that are hiring right now? Like what's, what's some good tips for people to find those people who are compliment, you know, compliment their skills and everyone else on the team? Yeah, boys. And we're, we're struggling with some of that, even with, with staffing and thinking about it a little bit differently. Uh, you know, the, this becomes true of sort of most ideas when you're trying to kind of germinate them and figure it out. It's like, just go back to what, what always worked for you. Like what, who are the people that you knew? What's your network? How can you get the word out there of what you need? Um, from a nonprofit standpoint, there's a huge amount of resources from a network standpoint. The, a lot of the chambers in our areas have a nonprofit side. Um, the, the United Way has a great leadership class for, you know, for nonprofit leaders and just building that. I mean, I had been in Chester County, the private school I worked in was over in Montgomery County. So I was gone for about five years, but as soon as I came back, I immediately connected with those networks. And as soon as we needed staff, that's the first place I reached out to and looked, um, you know, and steal. I mean, it's, you know, if you, uh, I mean, that's, it's maybe not the, the fairest philosophy. I still love the YMCA. I'm a huge supporter of what they do. Um, but I, I knew what I knew, right? So I brought those people in that I knew would be successful, you know, working with me and working in this kind of environment. So I, I think those, I don't know if those are great strategies, but, but having others around you who are going to help you be successful, whether that's peers, you know, people that you've worked with in the past or just whatever, I think that's what I always go back to. And so I noticed you didn't mention anything like online job postings or job boards. Like, do you do anything with that or do you not find that effective? No, <laughs> I, so we were just talking. I mean, from a there, there are certain level positions we have, especially for the restore, which are sort of retail positions that we need part time folks for. And we'll reach out to that as well. But, you know, we were just looking at some of the prices for some of those online and they've sort of exploded and it's it just doesn't work as well. You know, we don't get nearly the amount of applicants, you know, that that we would want. We've had so many great referrals. I, I will say it's really important, and, and we've been talking about this, just how to strategize this better, of, of getting on my door more diverse staff, working with more diverse you know companies out there. And so leveraging networks don't always work as well that way, because if your network is sort of stuck with kind of who you are and what you respond to, you're going to miss some of those opportunities. So we've been really purposeful in trying to reach out in kind of different ways to find, to bring in more of... of We've been really successful on our on our vendor side. We, um, from a marketing standpoint, we just we hired a group that's a, an all woman led business that's doing all of our marketing now, which is fantastic, and, and others too that do some of those resources for us. So you know, finding that piece is a little bit different, maybe more online tactics. But boy, for the most part, your networks, your friends, your your people who care about your organization, our board has been wonderful at being able to kind of make suggestions and find folks as well. So, what kind of marketing stuff do you guys do? What do you promoting? Are you trying to find volunteers? Or are you just looking for fundraising? What's what's your guys' marketing initiatives? Yeah, because I mentioned we have, we're sort of three different organizations all at once, mm -hmm. right? So we have a whole separate marketing piece for the ReStore, and we sort of treat that like a retail marketplace. So getting the word out that we take donations, that we actually are open in Phoenixville, that's our newest store. It's We're waiting for that to catch on fully. It's doing okay, but it, I, we think it could do gangbusters uh, soon enough. So getting that word out for folks. Yes, the fundraising piece. Marketing for, if, if nonprofits, in my opinion, do the right thing, it's not about asking money. It's about telling the story. It's about showing impact. It's about you know understanding what the mission is. And the people respond to that. So we don't focus on asking folks to support us. We focus on telling people, this is the impact we're having and we need more support to make bigger impact. And, and, that's, and that's an easy message to tell my development director is amazing at doing that. I mean, that's why I brought her over because she she would make you cry on one point, man. She she knows the stories that are happening all across our organization and is able to sort of connect that to the mission and then put it out there. So that's its own piece. And then the other one is is attracting uh, families because not everybody understands what Habitat does. You know, some people think we are Section Eight and 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 that it's for for very low income, and that's not the case. So there's a whole group of people in Chester County that are making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand a year that would fit into the model for home ownership, but they just don't know they do. And so they're just stuck renting. So that's another big piece of marketing for us is getting the word out that, hey, come apply and especially apply now because we're going to be doing more than 70 homes over the next five years of, of new builds, which is unheard of. It's more than any of our sister affiliates are doing right now, more than probably a lot are doing even across the country at, the, at this level. So that's exciting. And then yes, volunteers is the other piece that we continue to get the word out. But those marketing, again, that's mostly just connecting friends to what we do, 
telling the story, seeing, you know, the, the impact and, and, and seeing the progression of homes being built and getting people to come out and want to be a part of that. So specifically, what tools and strategies are you using to communicate those messages? Like, are you doing Facebook posts? Are you doing uh, videos? Or, or what are you doing? Yeah, so Skidgetal, I'll give them some credit. They, they've been really great at helping us. They're a company out of, out of uh, Westchester. And um, we, we've, we're we redoing our website now. What we're realizing a lot of the, so we do a lot of social media and a lot of newsletters. And some, some of that's both print marketing and then a lot of stuff online. I've been doing uh, quarterly updates um, from an executive director standpoint. So if we go onto our website or onto our Facebook page, you can see me, which is not, not that exciting, but usually a guest or two that comes with me and we talk about critical home repair or the things or, you know, volunteerism and stuff that we're kind of talking more about during that time frame. But Schedule's been really great at redirecting and understanding the metrics behind what goes out there for those. We were doing a lot of this internally. Again, this is one of those, what got us here won't get us there as we continue to grow. And so understanding pass through rates and clicks and all of those pieces, they've been really help, helpful in getting that done. And what we realized is that, oh, people are getting to our website and they're kind of not going deeper because we haven't had a great website. So they're helping us rebuild our website. But so all those mechanisms are important, all the constant contact pieces, all the newsletters, you know, all of the events that we do, making sure that that's all publicized. And yes, there's a Facebook, there's Twitter. Um, we're, we're threatening to get into TikTok. That's, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that works out. There are some great um, restores that do an amazing job of getting followers because they run through their store and they have, you know, really creative people who are showing them what they're selling and they also have the personality to pull that off. So we definitely have the kind of staff that could do that. We just haven't implemented it yet. TikTok is always the final frontier <laughs> for uh, social media. <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of people kind of resisting, but I mean, it, it makes sense because it's, it's so popular with the, the youngest generation who's on there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about through COVID now, like this is the, excuse me, the supply chain stuff. How are you guys dealing with all the challenges of stuff costing way more? Is it increased fundraising or what's the strategy to combat all the rising costs of everything? Uh, yeah, that is a huge kind of threat to the organization. We, we've been blessed again to have generated, you know, the additional revenue we've needed to be able to do it. But a perfect example is, is, is uh, lumber, right? That went up just the insane amounts. And so it was, it was 50, 60, 75% higher than it was at one point. And so there's at least a $50,000 increase in the, the price to build a new home right now for us. So 50,000. So multiply mm -hmm. that by the 70 that we're going to be doing in the next few years. And that's, that's really hard to sustain. Um, we have leaned in hard on our relationships with vendors. So we, we actually have what's called a kind of a national store where we can go in and buy everything, you know, all kinds of different like light fixtures and, you know, tools and light bulbs and stuff. And luckily, Have International has been doing a really strong out push for other organizations to, to partner with them to be able to do that. So we're trying to leverage some of that. But there's no doubt that the cost of that has increased kind of at every level. That's why I mentioned these these you know walls that are being built with, with lumber. I mean, lumber's become, it's, you know, it's people used to worry about people coming on the job sites and stealing cable and copper. It's wood. I mean, it's literally that expensive now to have like a, a sheet of wood. So... So we've had to really think about that differently the, and, and sort of, and what's maybe pushed us a little further along and we're still looking at some of these uh, ideas is, can we build differently? Are there prefab things we can do? I, I mentioned there's a Habitat who's building 3D walls now, you know, with using a 3D printer to build concrete walls to lower that cost. That's an amazing thing. You know, we, we now have, it's one of the coolest days on the construction site, but we have um, a, a group that comes in and li literally builds the walls, concrete walls, they're double sided and they kind of have the all the stuff and they have in the middle, but they bring them in on cranes and lower them in, you know, and so the footprint is already created and that's been helpful. We have an amazing board member who runs an HVAC company and seeing the prices were about to just jump, you know, just crazy high. Uh, we were able to buy all the ones we needed for all 40 homes uh, in West Grove at that at the lesser rate. He donates the fifth one too out of each each group of five, which is amazing and stores them for us. So, you know, things like that have helped to mitigate some of that cost. And, and those have almost, they've gone up 50%. So we've saved 50% on all of those units going forward. So we're doing everything we can, but it's definitely been an impact. Have you guys adjusted your strategy? Like, oh, we may, maybe we, in whatever 10 years we want to slow down, or is it just, we got to ramp everything else up to meet these new costs? Yeah, our, our board has set the tone for, we want to serve as many families as we can. 
and, and not just serve families. We want to have an impact on affordable housing in Chester County. So what does that look like? You know, and the first piece of that is, yeah, we're going to get through these challenges of funding. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll, we'll raise more money. We'll find other sources of revenue, but we're not going to slow down builds and implement critical home repair, you know, and do rehabilitations. Um, and then think about even how can we as an organization leverage the strength of the Habitat brand, the other habitats in the area, the other affordable housing to, um, to do to lobby for, for the needs of what we need too. So we're not just thinking about building those new homes, but how do we open up the pathways to get more land development, to have land banks, to think about how we support other organizations, you know, and work together to be able to, to do the things we want to be able to do. Chester County is going to need 50,000 more new homes in the next 10 years for affordable housing to, to, to keep it even sustainable. Where does that come from? You know, and, and we're going to be a, a part of that. We're going to be a chunk of that. But how do we leverage that to be able to? And a great example of that, too, is, you know, the state budget that went through not long ago, um, the habitats all throughout Pennsylvania, all talking to one another, leveraging, reaching out to our, you know, our folks in Congress. And we were able to get a significant, I think it's $350 million put back into the budget that had been pulled out for whole home repair, so which will help us with that critical home repair program. And, and so we'll, we'll hopefully get a, um, a piece of that for Chester County. But those kind of leveraging, just thinking about it now, even as a bigger picture. So it's a challenge, but I luckily coming in as I did, I don't know any better. So it's sort of got, it ramped up, got expensive right when I got here. So as it goes down, I guess it'll feel great. That's good. Are you guys doing any more like those conversion type projects where you take up one big house and turn it into three units? Is that something you guys are doing now or? We're looking at it. Yeah, we, some of it will be new builds and just how new construction is done. Um, and, but that takes a different kind of zoning and being able to have a little bit more density. It's not high density apartments. It's not the single family home. So we'll look at that. But again, we have models all throughout the habitat, you know, kind of world that we can look at and show that it's worked. And thinking, I think even bigger than that, Charlotte um, has a great model where they're partnering with um, two for-profit vendors. They're building about 150 homes together. There's a third that is for um, 55 plus. There's a third that's for low-income individual homes. And then there's like these condos that they're building. But a third of each of those is to the side for affordable housing. So it, it's unique. So it's what's great about that, it's a mixed income community. There's a lot more resources that they can leverage and really think about the whole community, you know, what they can provide to it. And they're affecting the lives of 150 people. So I, I think there's those kinds of opportunities in Chester County, which is great. Again, we talked about this at the beginning. What's unique about Chester County is that it's so many different types of populations. There are rural parts, urban parts, and there's different funding sources that can come from those different opportunities. So if we start thinking about building in the southern part of the county where there's more farms and you know, different things like that. There are other things through the federal government, through other organizations that we can leverage to maybe to do some of those bigger pieces down there, which attracts more folks down to that part of the county. It, there's just a lot to be able to kind of think through. What I've sort of grown into in the role in the last couple of years is not just being a home builder, but being a developer. And what does that mean from a larger scale of like infrastructure and, and all the amenities and, and not just us providing the homes, but who are we partnering with to do more? And thinking about sustainability, we have one potential project coming up and we're still working through the details of it, but it, if it works um, the way that it's sort of laid out, it's a solar farm that would provide all of the electricity for all 40 to 50 homes that we're building. So not only are we giving them that 0% 30 year mortgage and helping them on that side, but imagine no power bill. That'd be amazing. Yeah. How much freedom do you guys have as, you know, a subsect of the grand Habitat Humanity, you know, the total, I guess it's worldwide, right? It is, yeah. Habitat International. So under Habitat International, how much freedom do you guys have to make creative decisions in how you want to grow and help your specific community of Chester County? There's a lot of flexibility in that. And I think that's even grown over the last couple of years. What what keeps us all grounded is the mission of Habitat. And, and uh, our board, you know, looks at that every year and, and, and commits to that. Um, we pay an affiliate fee back into Habitat International to help with the international work. We, we sort of a changing model as we speak, but it's but typically we would tie the certain amount to be able to help with builds all over the world. We uh, reach out to Guatemala directly and, and do some builds there and help there. So that part all keeps us connected, but what Hampton International and the leadership there has really been pushing is, is that the, the need for affordable housing is so great. There's not one model that works. Let's all be creative and think about that. And think about it from homelessness all the way to being fully homed. And what, and what are the ways we can have impact in that way? 
uh, Habitat Canada now does high density apartment homes um, to get people in there. There's other groups that do transitional housing and uses their, you know, kind of a rent to own model. So none of that was written into that original, you know, we'll build our homes together, we'll mortgage it and we'll move to the next one. So there's some freedom to sort of think about that differently. And then when we think about sustainability and how we build there too, I, I think the model for building itself is just gonna look differently. Can we do prefabbed homes? Can we do tiny homes or, you know, uh, the granny pods, as they call them now, like different things like that to think about, do we have to have the same look and model throughout? And what we hear, you know, from international is, let's let's see go go try new things and tell us what's working and what's not so um you kind of talked about your five-year plan do you have a a grander scale plan beyond that or where you want to see chester county habitat going over the next decade or two um i you know i'm afraid to put a 10-year plan out because it'll be done in two so <laughs> um we we've really focused in on we sort of had that first five-year plan which happened pretty quickly we have ne the next kind of five-year plan with those 70 plus that we're building and then like i said there's more there's more information coming soon um that we that we think we're going to have a, a dramatic impact on our operations and how we're able to to support families so it, it's changing so fast and it's and the, and the need for what we do is so great that it's hard to sort of set a goal that is high enough so I, I think for me, it's sort of step stones. If, if we can do this, then we can probably do more. If we, then we can do that, we can probably do more. And so giving us a, a reasonable amount of time to do the first couple steps seems smart, but with an aggressive board and a, and a truly talented board at that, I mean, it's and, and the staff team that we're now building, we're, we're and, and the leveraging that we're able to do across the county, but also across the state from an advocacy standpoint, I think once we get another year or so into all of this and can then show our work, I always think that's it's great to have a plan, but if you can show the success of, of the you know what you're doing, which has been helpful with the uh, different sites we have right now, but at a grander scale to show the difference and impact that we're making, I, I think there's a place ultimately I want us to be the voice of Chester County when it comes to affordable housing. I, I want us at every table having every discussion in every municipality and, and, and Habitat for Humanity being the model that people see as a, as, as a piece of it. The thing that I haven't figured out yet is the long-term piece of affordable housing and keeping it sustainable. We're extremely successful at building wonderful houses that when people go to sale are no longer affordable. And so figuring out how to sort of break that and, and keep those in house, that's sort of the next big piece. So thinking, you know, not now, but 30 years or 20 years from now when they go to sell their home, how do we get that back into the affordable housing stock? How do we do more of those? Um, so I am thinking ahead in that in that sense, but yeah, let's get through the next year. Okay, so um, just as we move towards a wrap up, do you have any tips for people who are in nonprofit, maybe in like an admin role, or even if they're just starting out, anything to help them, like a mindset? What's what's kind of your tips for people who are getting started and trying to grow nonprofit businesses? You know, treat it as a business. Learn every single part of it. I think that's there, there are folks I think who look in from the outside of a nonprofit and think, oh, you know, there's a different skill set that you need. But some of the most successful nonprofit leaders came from the profit world because they know what works. I, I pay people what they're worth, you know, I mean, it, and, and hire really talented people to do those jobs. I mean, it's no different than any other you know, for profit world. If you want the best people, you have to pay for it and you have to you know, think about it. I mean, if let, let's spend Ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars more to get a person who's going to raise a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars more, right? I mean, it just makes sense. You would do that in a for-profit world. So get in, understand every single part of the operation, and then get your hands out of it, and, and and hire good people to be able to do that piece of it. And that way, you have at least enough of a knowledge to know what they're doing, to support them when they need it, to recognize when things need to be kind of aligned a little bit differently again. You know, and build relationships. I mean, that is ultimately what it all comes down to: is is can you leverage those relationships and all in whatever nonprofit you're running, right? And, and those people, and those connections, and those for-profit world, but in other places that can give you the support you need. You know, when when your time comes to make those asks. Good. Um, anything you want to announce about Habitat for Humanity, Chester County? Anything coming up or volunteer requests? Anything? <laughs> Yeah, I just keep an eye out. I wish I wish I could say more about the one big thing that's coming, which is very exciting. Um, it will be some support that will help us expand our operations greatly. Um, you know, yeah, the big thing is we're we're everywhere over Chester County. Uh, we do a lot of work in Coatesville because there's a lot of need there. 
Um, we're doing a lot of work in West Grove, but we're now in Phoenixville. We've done work in Pottstown, Westchester, Downingtown, you name it. So we're, we're, we're the habitat of Chester County. And so we're everywhere. So that, that's a, an important message for everyone to know that if you're in need of affordable housing in Chester County, in any part of it, uh, reach out. I, I think that's the next big piece for us too, is being able to leverage the amount of folks that are asking for homes and going to those municipalities and saying, hey, we have families who live here, you know, rent here, but want to stay here, want to vote here, want to, want to spend their money here. Can, can we work together to find more homes? So come, come to the website and, and look to volunteer, look to become a homeowner, look to support us in any way that you can. Okay. Well, Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. Pleasure. Stories from the Top is your guide to successful business development. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or find Edge of Cinema on YouTube. Stories from the Top is an Edge of Cinema production hosted by Matthew Skura and Jeremy Schmidt. To learn more or get in touch, visit edgeofcinema.com slash podcast.